All right, I wish everybody good afternoon. My name is Gordon Bursic. I'm a political scientist in social sciences department here at GRCC. And uh, I'm delighted to be able to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Yen Bai, from the same department. He's also a political scientist. He basically deals with the uh, study of international relations, Asian politics, and comparative politics. And I think on the side, he does American politics, too. <laughs> Uh, today he is going to talk about the relationship between uh, equality and diversity. I cannot imagine a more complicated relationship and I think this particular relationship uh, raises a bunch of uh, very interesting and thought-provoking issues. So uh, without further ado, here is Professor Yen Bai. Hmm. <laughs> ah, <okay. laughs> ah. Yeah. Let me use this one. What does equality mean? Um, yeah. How about this one? First one, equality on the law. Uh, equal treatment of all the people under the law. That's government. I think that's the minimum. Uh, that's the minimum requirement for the government to treat people with uh, respect. Uh, in other words, uh, the first thing the uh, government has to treat people under the law equally is that uh, the people must be uh, treated as the uh, individuals, not the member of the groups. Uh, usually, the uh, people are categorized uh, by their appearances like race, ethnicity, gender, even age. Uh, the question is, should government treat you as a member of a certain social group? Should government allocate you know, resources, uh, rewards, or punishment uh, based on your biological trait, which you have no control of? Uh, now, equality under the law means uh, the government cannot. You're just a person. You're an individual. Uh, the Constitution does not say you are categorized or grouped into a certain, uh, certain uh, category or classification. If a person uh, is uh, perceived or classified as a member of the uh, social uh, group, that's wrong. That's against our assumption. We're equal. We're equal as human beings, individuals, not the members of a certain social group. So uh, that's why I say that's the minimum requirement uh, law, because law is made by the government. Government makes laws. And we are treated equally before laws. So the first thing is, we are individuals. We are not members based upon how we look, based upon you know, who we are. The second thing is uh, the government's uh, classification of the uh, people according to race, uh, gender, or age is presumably uh, wrong because it goes against our belief because we believe our, our laws, the Constitution included, are colorblind. You know, everybody is perceived as just a person, so no color, no color is added, so your skin color is not an issue, it's relevant. So every time the government uh, has to be uh, careful, if the government ever uses race as a base or determinant uh, for its uh, formulation of the policy, we have to ask a question. We have to ask questions. We have to use this uh, constitutional test. And this test is uh, made by the Supreme Court uh, in 1944. Uh, the title is uh, Kurematsu versus uh, United States. Now, in this decision, in this uh, ruling, the Supreme Court said if government uh, must use race uh, as a determinant for making a decision, the government has to be scrutinized. I mean, the agency of the uh, government which makes policy has to be 
examined at the court. So we call, we call this the, uh, the test of strict scrutiny. Strict scrutiny means, uh, again, the government uh, has to show uh, a reasonable cost. Uh, you know, everything government has to do, government has to show a reason. Now, for race, the use of race cannot be uh, justified unless government can show, okay, I have to use race to allocate the limited resources because race, there's no other ways to skip the use of race. But the government has to show uh, the reason the rationale, the justification behind this is compelling, is overwhelmingly important. It's not just the regular, simple reason, justification. It has to be compelling public interest. So this is the rule of law. I mean, we believe in the uh, rule of law. This is the uh, strict scrutiny of the Supreme Court. Uh, so, I don't know whether that's clear or not. Bubble, is that clear? Uh, okay. Strict scrutiny. Uh, on race, uh, the uh, scrutiny level is strict. If the government uses uh, gender to treat women differently before the law, the so scrutiny level is intermediate. I mean, there are different levels of uh, scrutiny uh, on different things, on different issues. Uh, we're talking about race. Racial uh, distinction is uh, considered as the most uh, contentious uh, issue in, in our society. I mean, different societies have different uh, social divisions, privileges, different issues, but race issue is supposed to be the most contentious. Uh, conflictual. So that's why we use strict, strict scrutiny. For women issue, we use uh, intermediate. For other issues, uh, you know, on which government use discrimination, distinction, the other one would be called the uh, uh, rational, rational scrutiny. So we don't let government uh, go easily unless government can, you know, prove there is an important reason for that. So that's the first part, uh, treatment, uh, equal treatment under the law. Okay, let me. A question here for this issue is, uh, what can be the most important uh, compelling public interest? to justify the government's treatment of the people by race. I mean, you know, d discrimination is defined as unreasonable, unfavorable treatment of people based on their race. Uh, so government cannot do that. Government cannot do that. Government cannot use race to identify people. But sometimes government uses race. So government has to pass this test, like affirmative action. Affirmative action is used uh, for government to treat uh, uh, African Americans uh, you know, favorably. In addition to uh, affirmative action, what else? What other issues can be compelling enough for the government you know, to treat people uh, differently? So that, that's a question I, I, uh, I pose here for you to think about. Now the second issue is this. The second one is the equality uh, of opportunity. Uh, what does that mean? What's you know, equality of opportunity? Are we supposed to have equal chance opportunity to realize our dreams, our potentials? Yes, uh, e equality of uh, opportunity rights of the people to realize their uh, human potentials. Um, 
let, let me ask you, uh, what's, what's your understanding of this? What, what's uh, equality of opportunity to you? Anybody uh, above? What, what's your opinion on this? So what's, what's your thought on that? Um, I'd say with equality of opportunity that it is everyone's right to achieve what they want. You set a goal for yourself to the things you want to do. <coughs> Pushing yourself to the best of what you're able to do. I think you're able to do. So, okay. Uh, is that right? Russell? Russell? I don't know. I kind of... You're the only one. You decide. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Who's, who's to determine what that individual potential is? So who, who determines? Is it you, the person himself, herself? If you think you can do it, if you think that you have the uh, potentials, if you think you have a dream, are you entitled to an opportunity to achieve that? Yeah. So, yeah, sorry, yeah. So the difference is in uh, talents. Do we have the talents to fulfill our dream? Uh, do we have you know, the uh, capabilities or abilities, intelligence required to fulfill our dreams? So in that regard, uh, opportunity, I mean, you know, equality of opportunity does not guarantee the equality of result. Is that right? I mean, you know, we're given the equal opportunity to just try, but we're different. Equality is supposed to be the opportunity, but we're different in terms of what? Intelligence, industry. People work uh, very hard. Uh, some people don't work hard. So we are not going to uh, end up you know, at the same line. So equality of opportunity is just the means. It's not the end. Is that right? Rebecca, do, what, what, what's your thought on that? Or, or do you need, uh, Okay, qualification, training. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not the fact that, you know, it's unfair. It's just, it's just that there's limitations to everything. Right, yeah, I, I know. Uh, so because of that, you know, women, 
Women can be treated uh, differently uh, from men. Uh, do, do, does government have certain policy to treat women uh, in certain ways different from men? Uh, yes, you know, like you know, firefighter or, or military services. Uh, again, I mean, the, the uh, scrutiny level for treating women differently is uh, intermediate, which means you know, government can easily pass that hurdle and make law. But for race, uh, it's, it's, it is called, you know, strict. The strict level is the highest, the most typical. So government has to prove more. Uh, because, I mean, again, race, gender, they have nothing to do with your performance. But in terms of firefighter, that's a different thing. As far as schooling, education, what, what What's the matter of you know, race? Race doesn't make any difference as far as who should go to school, who should get a certain job. So that's why we say that's discrimination because that's so artificial. It is so irrelevant. If government ever uses race, government has to show the compelling justification. But uh, equality of uh, opportunity is again the, uh, the means. It, it doesn't guarantee that you'll get what you want at, at the end of the day. Another thing is this, uh, we said you know, there are differences between people in terms of their uh, qualification and training, abilities, intelligence. The other uh, difference is that uh, people are born into different situations. People are born into different uh, Environments, families. I mean, you know, kids from uh, wealthy families, their their parents are wealthy or well connected. So these kids are more uh, better off in terms of you know making connections. I mean, making money, getting jobs. So equality of opportunity cannot solve that problem. Is that right? Yes? Doesn't that basically abolish equal treatment for all? Say that again, the abolishing equal treatment? Equality of opportunity, in the sense that you just described, mm -hmm. pretty much abolishes equality, equal treatment for all. Yeah, OK. Uh, well, well, I don't think it's abolished. I, I think it's um, actually it just does the opposite. It gives. Uh, everybody a chance, but that chance is not enough. It's just uh, a chance, an opportunity. You, know, you have the opportunity to try. But uh, if you're born into a family that has nothing to back you up, you, you're more likely to fail, or you're more likely, you're not uh, you know, going to be end up with the same guy or with another guy who has different background. But you still have that you still have the opportunity. Do you uh, grow up in a circumstance where you know, your family is poor and doesn't have the opportunity that someone wealthy does? Do you still have that opportunity? Yeah. It's whether you take that opportunity and pursue it goal. That's the So there is opportunity for people to move up, uh, social mobility. Uh, yeah, you can change that. But again, I mean, the uh, likelihood, the, uh, uh, propensity, the possibility, is it, not much. I mean, there is a possibility. Right. Again, equality of opportunity is not the same thing of equality of result. So let's take a look at the equality of result of before we go to that. Um, Before we go to our equality of result, let me ask you this. Do you think the government's uh, policy to provide uh, equal uh, opportunity actually perpetuates the existing inequality? Yeah? It does. Yeah, it does. It basically abolishes equal. Oh, that's what you mean by abolishes. Okay.
it's like, you know, I'm hands off. I leave it alone. I leave it alone, but I do give you a chance. But what about people who have nothing to begin with? Compare those people, some people got everything. So this kind of uh, equality uh, does not actually uh, promote real equality. Neutrality perpetuates, maintains the status quo. For example, uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, used this uh, analogy. He said this. President Johnson said, uh, if you got uh, two persons in a race, you know, a competition to see who runs fast, one of the uh, runners is shackled. So apparently, the person cannot compete fairly with the other one. He got shackles, chains. Okay, Lyndon Johnson said, uh, even though you remove the shackles from that person, that person still has distance to catch up. Is that right? So we don't have a fair game in the first place. Yes? Individuals born the same day. Okay. That's basis. So you don't con you do consider that person's past history. No, because everybody is born right? the same day. Everybody has a brain intelligence. What if that person uh, was raised um, in a situation of discrimination? He got uh, no opportunity to go to school. His dad had to work. Got no money. So that person. Uh, is already left behind. So we don't start from the same start line. Right. I think there are some people, I mean, a few people like that. I mean, not all of them, or most of them can be like that. Well, everyone has. Yeah, just because you work hard, you got a, you know, a piece of chance. But, uh, it's just a choice, though. I mean, anyone can do that. It's just a choice. I think too many people choose not to go that extra step to, to reach that success. Okay. Yeah, that's here. Uh, well, Amanda. Well, I, I think it's like one step. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. 
I know, Ryan, I know your point. I mean, it's very possible for somebody to, to, to achieve that, to, to get ahead, to make more. But uh, compared, to, compared to the wealthy people, you've got more difficulties, you've got uh, more uh, hurdles. Mm. But of course, you know, there is a possibility, there is a hope. Uh, Okay, so that brings us to this one. Equality of result. Oh. Uh, that's okay. Just one chance, I mean, opportunity of um, equal opportunity. Does that mean just one opportunity? What if you fail? Are you entitled to another second opportunity? Second chance, third chance. Now this one. Hmm. So, result. We don't care about uh, or we care less about uh, the uh, process. We care about the end result. Resolve. Mm -hmm. Distribution. Yeah. You guys, hold on a second. If you don't ask a question into the microphone, no one's ever going to be able to hear you on the camera there. So wait for a microphone to come around. Apologize. I think uh, equality of uh, opportunity, as I uh, said, uh, does not uh, really, you know, destroy the equality under the law. It just perpetuates the existing inequalities. So, what should we do about that? I think, you know, another approach to provide another layer of equality is to look at the outcome rather than the opportunity. What you actually got, we have to look at the actual amount of benefit you have received, regardless of the process. So at the end of the day, okay, 
Is this what you get according to the proportion? Like African Americans account for like 13% of the population, so African Americans should receive 13% of benefits. Proportion. Proportional equality. Women account for like 51%. So women should receive 51% of uh, benefits, welfare, material, well-being. Again, I'm uh, just presenting this, and I would like to hear your opinion. Is this um, a positive way to promote uh, equality? I mean, there are many new dimensions which you can use to promote uh, equality. We, we talk about equality, uh, equal treatment under law, uh, equality of opportunity, and this one, the third one, equality of uh, result. Because you are you are thinking that's not fair. What about uh, you know performance? I mean, regardless how you perform, how hard you work, everybody gets the same thing. At the end of the day, that's not fair. Thomas, is that right, Thomas? You, you are shaking your head. Not fair. Not fair. Can you use a microphone, please? Oh, yeah. Thank you. All right. <laughs> I mean, if you're, if you're talking in the sense of uh, everyone in the population getting the same thing, or like, you know, like everyone brings in the same, gets the same thing. About same thing, approximately. Yeah. yeah. I feel like the problem with that is, is it would often negate someone's want to strive for bigger and better things. Because if my job is picking up rocks off the street, and my neighbor's a nuclear physicist, and we bring in the exact same amount of everything and have the same benefits and everything like that, and what's going to make the next generation say, well, I'm going to go study really, really hard to go to advanced things rather than I can just walk around and do nothing. OK. Well, what about uh, just providing the basics, the basic uh, necessities for you know, the less fortunate people to live a decent life? Basics. Not, we are not talking about you know, high paid jobs, basic things. I think that. I think that providing okay. yeah. so that everyone has an equal opportunity for life and things like that is, is fair. I don't think anyone should be left out. But at the same time, systems like that have an extreme history of being completely taken advantage of and mutilated. Uh, Rebecca, is that right? Well, who decides what's basic? I mean, my basic Donald Trump's are, I mean, not the same. Just like his question, who decides whose potential is? Yeah. I mean, who, what is basic? Basic things like shelter, food, clothing, health care. I mean, you know, for a person to live a decent life, I mean, a person must have those things. So they're poor, they they don't deserve, uh, or they don't work as hard, so they don't deserve. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to get you to you know, discuss with me. I, mean, I don't actually support one or two of them. I just present this you know, for you to think. Yeah. But as we've seen with the, uh, the welfare system, it's basically you know, it's providing for basic needs, and it's so abused, A and B, it's a really hard cycle to get out of. Once you're in the welfare system, it tends to go from generation to generation to generation, and they never break that cycle. They, they never better themselves. So welfare should be abolished? Yes? No, but there should be uh, more, sh there should be a regulation on how many years you can be on it. on it until they're 18 and then they get right on it from there and you know I see it happen all the time and they never get a chance they're never given the you know the classes or you know they're never taught to get out of that cycle and to you know go to school and um, you know be self-sufficient versus living you know off the government like they have their whole life because that's how they were raised and that's all they know hmm. yeah again I keep saying these types of equality of opportunity Comes, comes, yeah, like quality a form of the action. Quality because somebody's got to pay for it, and that somebody is the people who really have a gun at their head and the taxes that they have to pay over to the government. Yeah. So they are not as equal as someone else who gets their, their money. Okay. Actually, uh, okay, when we talk about 
uh, you know, welfare, we think of poor people. But wealthy people, corporate people, business people, do they get a welfare? Are they rewarded for their failures? Do they deserve? I mean, like, you know, Chrysler, yes. GM. Can I answer? Yeah. Sure, they're rewarded for their failures. Look yeah. at the recent collapse of the, the market, the economy and the housing industry or the banking yeah. industry. They were all bailed out by the federal government. It, that's welfare. That welfare for the rich. That's, yeah. that's why it should be abolished. Why, why do we give welfare for the wealthy for people? I mean, they, do they need basic things? Like, well, like I said, that's why welfare should be abolished. Welfare. For, you cannot have equality in a society that supports welfare schemes. So everybody has to be you know, on his own. With no welfare, no safety net. Correct. Really? Okay. Um, I think we just really need to consider like where we place our value in innovation. I mean, if you have a system where you're focused on everybody gets an equal proportion or everybody gets the same basic things, you tend to gravitate more towards an industrial society and not focus on education because there's no benefit in moving to a higher education. So I mean, once you take, once you add that, then where's in it? We're not having innovation in wisdom because you're caught in the same little section because there's no value to go to higher education anymore, and I think that's a big thing that we need to remember. I, I agree with that. Um, if you give everybody the same thing, there was no incentive uh, to go to school, to invest, to work hard or harder. But again, when you see the poor people on the street. Do you, you don't feel sympathy? You don't feel sympathetic with them? You don't feel like you know you should do something or you should do something with them? No. Yeah, right. Well, I kind of think like if you look back on history, first off, like collectivized agriculture um, was a big fail in a lot of communistic states. So that's kind of like welfare or an attempt at equality, but it didn't work at all. And the other thing is like welfare. Like Professor Price said over there, um, you know, it's taken from other people. How is that fair that I have to pay my money to support someone that's choosing not to work? Uh, yeah, granted, there's points. I can't say that everyone doesn't choose not to work. There's other people that have circumstances where they can't work, but they can still try and be persistent and try and find a job somewhere. But there's a lot of people who abuse the system that choose not to work, and I have to pay for that with my work and my money when I could be taking in that extra money and using that for my own benefit, for my own good, so I can advance myself and get farther in the world with my life. How is that fair and how is that equal? Dr. Bai, can I ask a question of the audience? <laughs> yes. Can, can I get a show of hands? How many of you people are property owners? How many of you own your own home right now? Hands up. Okay, look around the room. That's a very few people here. How many of you are students here at GRCC? You are all on welfare. Yeah. Your education, this building, your professors, your parking ability, the roads you drive on to get here are all paid by taxpayers. How are you different from someone who's poor? Yeah. I, uh, I have a job, so even though I don't own land, I do own my own car, it's paid full in cash, I do have a job, so I do pay for those taxes to pay for the roads, which everyone else drives for. But for this place, you do not. This comes from property taxes. And you are here, like someone over here, better yourself, right? Right. I, I can understand people get mad, you know, they're, people see it as they're taking money from them, recirculating it somewhere else, which they say is people need help. And I don't, I don't totally agree with getting rid of welfare, because you know, we, people don't think about it, you do. Like he was pointed out, you know, this institution is paid for on welfare. And I don't think that should be totally abolished. I think it has to be maybe amended and changed. You know, the people in the middle of the ones that don't that don't really think that they're getting help a lot of times, like um, high up the really rich, you know, the businesses are being bailed out and they feel that the people on the low end are getting help, but in the middle, you know, you have a small business and you go under, there's no you're done. And you have to pay the, the what you owe, and that's about it. So I think it needs to be restructured more equally, if you're going to call it, than what it is now. Not really totally abolished, though. Um, I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, with him in regard to that, just that there needs to be some 
some amendments to the welfare system, but there's no way that it needs to be abolished. I mean, granted, some people do abuse it. I mean, it goes with food stamps and everything like that. Some people do abuse it, but for the people that actually need it, it's very, very beneficial. You can't take away basic rights of food and shelter to someone who can't, some people just can't afford it. Some people, that's all they know. They really don't know any better. Right. And that's, I mean, you need to provide that to them. You can't take that away from them. That's inhumane in a way, I think, so. Yeah. Do you think some people are deserving poor? They deserve help? And some people are not are deserving poor. They're abusers. I mean, you know, people who, who have lost their arms or who were born just poor. Are they deserving poor? Do they need some help? They need help. Everybody, every family needs some help at some point. So, you know, we can't abolish welfare system. But what welfare system for the, for the rich people? I mean, stimulus plan, bail out. What about those? Oh, I mean, quick question, quick comment to the, I have two quick comments. Um, first one to the education system and how we're on welfare. Yeah, I get that, but we're so focused on the short term these days that we're, we're like, we're in a bad economic system, therefore we all need help and there's no other option. But the thing is, with the way our economic system is, we have gained dependency on welfare, we have gained dependency on high education costs, but if we were to, I think we were to eliminate a lot of these boundaries and these, a lot of these uh, regulations, I think the price of college would go down. It'd be more possible for a private education or even a public education, I guess. And um, to the comment about the homeless, um, I really don't have a problem with uh, helping the homeless, not at all. I mean, I, I've done it for lots of years. But when it comes to the idea of taxes, I think that when we give tax, I like to know where my money is going to, you know? And when, when it goes to tax, I don't know that's going to this specific organization. I would rather give my money to a private organization where I know that I can help, where I know exactly who I'm helping and what cause I'm helping. I think that's my biggest thing. Yeah. My comment is uh, just that back to, can you hear me? My point is that uh, back to your race analogy uh, that the wealthy are starting farther ahead on the racetrack, that's fine, but I think what makes people mad is that welfare is viewed as those people who are starting behind me, every time I pay into welfare, they're jumping in a cart and driving around the cart faster and never attempting to actually get in the race. Uh, I think <laughs> that's where people would get upset if someone's not even taking a step on that track to get forward then that's what everybody's getting upset about. Not the people who are using welfare for what it's made for, it's for the people who are abusing it or just standing in one spot. Okay, all right. I haven't heard many stories about uh, how people uh, abuse the uh, welfare system, but you said that some people jump into the car so they run faster ahead of you. Um, maybe that's true. Okay. Um, yeah, we, Set it up, meritocracy. I mean, you know, it's based on your performance, and apparently, the quality of result uh, ignores uh, your performance. Your performance is not uh, related or irrelevant. So, the question is, meritocracy. Is, is that uh, still uh, valid? Is, is that still our value? No. Suppose someday you want to help the poor. The question is how? Uh, well, you know, yeah. You can give them a donation, you can give them charity. Uh, I think this is the like, um, moral question, testing your morality, uh, positive right versus uh, negative duty, or positive duty versus negative right. I want to hear your voice. Yeah. Okay. You know, you don't do anything because that's your not your duty. You are not required by mo by moral duty to do anything. The negative part is okay. Are the poor people entitled? Negative uh, right versus positive right. I throw out this for you to uh, think about. It's doing nothing kind of help 
or you have to do something to prevent the poor people from uh, suffering from starvation. I know that I come from like a really radical yeah. thought of thinking that we should only give out of our ac excess. I mean, I don't think that we, I think that we should help the poor, most definitely. I think we should help, we have a basic, and we have to help the people that are, aren't, that are in need, but I think that we need to get out, give out of our access. I think that still applies to the economy and our country as a whole, too. When we can't afford to help ourselves, we can't afford to help others. Once we get into a grounds where we are making a positive income or a positive whatever, a higher GDP, we can help the poor, but until then, we need to worry about ourselves, because that's, if we have a weak foundation, we're going to crumble, and that's how I think it should. That's my opinion. Growth, economic growth. Capitalism is about uh, production. Socialism is about uh, redistribution. So growth, tide will rise for both. Yeah. I think what we're arguing is the fact that we need to maintain some kind of edge in a capitalistic society. So social Darwinism needs to play a little bit in how we make our decisions as a government but not stepping on toes. I mean, eventually it's going to be socialism, which is not just now with socialistic characteristics. Socialism. You guys know social Darwinism is hogwash, right? I mean, not the whole notion that you could take Darwin's theory and take one line out of it and apply it to human societies is a little disingenuous. I guess my question would be, if you all think that you deserve to be where you are. I'll put it back on your shoulders. I like to do this to students all the time. So we're complaining about all these poor people who don't deserve our excess wealth. What have you done in terms of meritocracy to deserve the opportunity to be here at the taxpayer dollar to improve your lives? I mean, I'm sure there's some of us here that can say, I've, I'm paying for all my education, 100% out of my pocket. You know, I've done everything. There are some people, though, that they've grown up in an area where they've had a reliance up. They haven't had the opportunity to, to provide for themselves and do everything on their own. So to say you don't deserve something. Well, make no mistake. I'm not saying that you don't all pay your tuition and you don't have jobs and you don't kick into the tax system. You do that, but you do that in a very small level. The cost of your education that comes from your tuition is a small fraction of what it actually costs to run this place and to educate you. That's what I'm saying. It's subsidized. It's subsidized by other people who have money who agree that you deserve, even though you haven't done anything to deserve it yet, you deserve an opportunity to improve yourself, which is basically the same thing that Dr. Bai is asking us to think about. Isn't that a moral obligation? I would say yes. This, the community has an obligation to make sure you can all reach your full potential. Well, like, um, it was like in the mid-60s it got made where they were starting to give student loans out. Before that, only the very rich could go or the very, very lucky could get to because it wasn't you had to be able to pay for tuition 100% upfront, and most people couldn't afford it. So I say it is a big opportunity gamble they're making on us that we will take this and build upon the future. So we're all given um, a head start, as you could say. Right. Right. I was just gonna say that um, people, the human race, does have entitlement to the basic needs. I think. I mean. I mean, I do pay for everything. I pay for my tuition, but that's that doesn't really matter. It's in the broad scheme of things, I don't deserve to be where I am today. I mean, everybody I think deserves the basic needs, and to deprive someone of that, like I said before, I think is inhumane. And I think I I think I addressed this earlier too when I said um, uh, that it's the system that we're in that that raises a dependency on. Like for me, I wish I didn't have have to have people pay my tuition. I wish I could pay my own tuition, and I think that with the with the mindset and the system that we're in, we are bred and taught that we need a dependency on um, other people, and I think that we could actually decrease the cost of education and make it affordable to all people if we weren't dependent on the system, And because I think economically it would lower cost of education if there was competition in education. Now, with the community college system, everybody gets into community college. I'm not saying that should have the same competition as a Ivy League <laughs> university, but I think that we could lower cost if fewer people would attend. Because there's a lot of people that come to community colleges that don't take the take the full advantage of it. They're like, oh, I'm at a community college. It doesn't matter. I'll just scoot by and get a, get a associate's degree and get a big job. And it doesn't work that way. And I think it, it's abused. Um, 
I think uh, looking at the question there, uh, do we have the positive degree to prevent people from dying of starvation? I do believe that we do. It's just uh, a responsibility of taking care of those who are unable to provide for themselves. I think that uh, not everyone is as fortunate enough as to be born in the right family where um, some people have never had to work a day in their lives or some other ones, even if they try to work, they won't be able because they don't have the tools. And I believe that if they're helped by giving them the tools in the form of either education, in this case, or in college, and um, that just, that's giving them a, an opportunity and that one chance, two chances, I don't know, it's not even like third chances. They might not make the right choices when they're young and they decide to go out and party and they just decide they want the money, whatever little money they can make, they decide the second chance, then here is like how many chances? Two, three, they can come back to a community college and try to get a better education. And um, about welfare, yes, there might be some people that abuse the system but either way, the rewards there won't be as great as those who try to really to work hard and to provide for themselves. They're going to be living better than those people. So I really don't know why people kind of don't want to give to those. Yeah, I mean, there are some indolent people that don't want to work or they do not want, but I do believe that people, they want to be doing better for themselves. And even those who want to abuse the system, the reward is just, okay, they got away with it. So what? But those who are willing to work, they're going to be living much better than those who are abusing the system. And I think that's a much better reward myself. See, uh, I'm an I'm a, uh, immigrant from China. I, uh, I remember uh, when I first went to uh, the supermarket, uh, South Orange, New Jersey, that's where I went to school, Seton Hall. The uh, supermarket was called a uh, Passmark. I still remember, you know, Passmark. I was so overwhelmed by, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the quantity of commodities. Every shop was stuffed with everything. I mean, there were just so many choices. Uh, so, you know, Immediately, I thought of the uh, quotation from uh, Karl Marx. Capitalism is a society of the accumulation of commodities. You know, look at the supermarket. There's a huge com uh, accumulation of anything, anything you want for your life, to eat, to wear. But gradually, I you know, started to notice that uh, there were Poor people, there were, you know, minorities, uh, African Americans, uh, people on the street begging for food, homeless people. So I start to think: Is uh, is capitalism? Does capitalism create inequality? I mean, capitalism creates wonderful things. Capitalism, capitalist society, creates efficiency. Uh, prosperity, but does that also create inequality? Now, f after so many years, I mean, I've been here you know, in the United States for how many years? Since 1987. Uh, I have noticed that American people don't think in terms of social classes. We don't think in terms of social classes. We always think we are the middle class. We're socialized to think we belong to the huge, big middle class. So we, we don't really show sympathy to the people behind us or lower than us. We tend to think they are like us, or we think they are just a little, a few. So sometimes maybe I think maybe maybe that's a myth. Uh, you know, middle class. What's middle class? Are we members of the middle class? Um, I mean, you know, what about those people? You know, at the top, like one percent of the Americans at the very top. Think about uh, like what 25, 30 percent of the uh, national income. 
how do we explain this gap? Mm. I mean, of course, you know, we're, we're socialized to think, uh, you know, there's no such thing as exploitation. Mm. I, I just want to add uh, one more dimension for you to think uh, uh, in terms of uh, equality. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I don't know. You, yeah, I can. Okay, okay. Well, no country's uh, capital is, is, is pure. I mean, every economy is, you know, just mixed. Uh, yeah. But we got more capitalism, uh, you know, in terms of proportion. Yeah. But we do have, you know, free market, you know, private ownership, yeah. yeah based on. Yeah, your European economy are more skilled toward, uh, yeah, welfare state control regulations. But we're more skilled toward a radical free market mechanism. You know, people work hard, or the owners of the corporations do everything for money, for profit. I'm sorry, yeah. I think I have a fellow libertarian up there. Um, uh. And I, I fully agree, we have never achieved a truly capitalist society. And in the question, does capitalism lead to equality? I think, yes, it does. I mean, I, it depends on how you define equality. I define equality as the, you get the equal right to pursue your happiness or pursue your property. It's not saying you're going to get yeah, it. Yeah, that's equality opportunity. It, it's, yeah. But it's not a guarantee of mm -hmm. real well, equality. I guess what I'm saying is like capitalism encourages the building of wealth. And the building of wealth leads to access, access and money. And what we see in society today is you said you mentioned that the top 1% are the wealthiest and that they're the highest class. But what we see also is that this 1% is giving more in charity and more into yeah. other systems just because they can. It's not because they're nicer. It's not because they're friendly. It's just because they give more than what everyone else can. And if, if we had a truly more capitalist society, we would see more competition, more people reaching that level. Yeah, would there still be a division in class? I guess you could say that, but you would see more people being help, being able to help those below them because wealthy people do tend to give more. Okay. Yeah. Is it enough to make up for what the federal government and state and local governments provide on a daily basis for your ability to move about to create opportunities for you? Pri I don't see private citizens forking out money to pay for public schools. I don't see them forking out money to, to you know, su support roads. Because Van Andel Arena doesn't help poor people in this community. It's because they don't have to. Because they're, I mean, we are so, like, they have the mindset, oh, it's like free ridership. I mean, oh, so the government's going to do it. I don't need to do it. But I don't, I think people are human enough now to actually look at this and say, hey, there's people struggling when they actually are able to see it and they will help them. There are places in the world where you could go and try to make a living where the government does very little. They do the bare minimum. And I think you'd be surprised how difficult it is for you to operate as opposed to here where from the very beginning of this country, the government has subsidized opportunities for it, Americans. It, I think it truly depends on the culture though. I mean, when we, we can look at tons of other countries I and mean, we can look at Switzerland. I mean, yeah, they've kind of moved towards a more socialist um, system there, but. For years, they had a completely free market system. They had, and they they thrived. And I believe that we, it depends on how you were raised. If you were raised in a communist society, growing up in a communist society, and you all of a sudden you switch to a complete free market, you're going to collapse. But I think we've had lots of training in a pseudo free market way of thinking. And I think that we can make it work. I have to kind of disagree with what you just said um, about people not shelling out money to um, public schools. What? How much did Western just get? Uh, I think it was $100 million um, by a private investor. Anonymous, yes, but that was not government funded. That's $100 million. That's a lot of money for a public school. That could pay for a lot of tuition. No, it's not going for tuition, but it's going to. What's it going for? What's it, what's the building? They're building a new medical building, a new medical college, right. so the students can attend that medical college, which means that's going to be, that'll still reduce cost of tuition because that school doesn't have to pay for that building, so that's still beneficial to the students. And the other thing I have to say is, um, kind of along with like taxes, going back that way a little bit, is um, why don't we just choose what we pay our taxes for? Why don't we have the choice, the opportunity 
to choose what we pay for taxes. If you even want to pay taxes, that will give incentive to people to pay taxes. Because if you don't want to pay taxes, then your road's not going to get fixed. Your school's not going to be funded. And then people will still have the incentive to pay taxes rather than being forced to pay taxes and being discouraged and upset about it. Why don't we have that choice? Why don't we have that opportunity? Could you say that the funding of $100 million for another medical school is the rich funding the rich? Do, would we be better off spending that $100 million on Grand Rapids Public Schools or the Detroit Public Schools to help little kids who don't have an opportunity? I, I know Dr. Bai is not going to invite me back to any of these. Uh, you could. I like that. I like, I'm actually, I'm, I'm listening, I'm learning. Yeah. But you know, say, uh, Ryan have to know, you know their motive to, to do that. You know, the motive is not, uh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I would say absolutely not because D Detroit Public Schools and Grand Rapids Public Schools is a broken system. So why fund a broken system when, when Western is obviously a very good school? And yeah, I mean, you could say they're funding the rich, but there are scholarship opportunities in America. If you're poor and you work hard and you want to go to school, you will find a way. That's impact on the world. Is $100 million enough to finally fix the system? I mean, that's a microphone. <laughs> what I was saying, too, is I agree with what he said, that money for Western Michigan, yes, there are wealthy people. They do make uh, contributions to a certain extent. But if we did see their contributions, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. Van Andel's arena, I mean, they when they give money, it's so they can have their name on something. Not for not for social standing in the community, like you said, Grand Rapids is broken, but why not contribute money to the system so it's not broken? Why give money to Western Michigan University for a medical school? By the way, we just opened another medical school, a medical mile downtown, right? So why do we need another medical school when the Detroit systems in Grand Rapids, we obviously need help. And we're not getting it from the government and we're not going to with all these caps that we have. There's $100 million for the whole state of Michigan. How much money is gonna to go to the school? We got a hand here. I, I think if, to get to the heart of the matter, it, it comes down to two things, freedom or not. If someone in the room or someone sitting on a board somewhere has the right, so-called, to determine where my the product of my thoughts are allotted in society. I do not have freedom, and that's what we're talking about here. Uh, is do we need another medical school? If a private donor wants to create another medical school, that, that's nobody else's business. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not wealthy. I wasn't wealthy as a kid. I come from a family of 11 children. We were on welfare. About eight of them still are, and I managed to go through school, go through university, and law school, get my degree, and fortunately now I'm teaching here. <laughs> but nothing, I mean, nothing stood in my way. But, um, it, in a, you know, I mean, my degree was funded in large part by my academic scholarship. So, I mean, there is money out there from private sources. I tell my students, as well as my own children all the time, there's thousands and thousands of scholarship dollars, out, or different scholarships worth anywhere from one to twenty thousand dollars. The key is you gotta work for them though. You have to do something in order to win that scholarship. Yeah. So my my question to you is do you think the rich people owe so much to the society so they need to pay back a little? No. I mean Warren Buffet once said uh, the reason he got so much money, he made so much money is because he got so much benefit from the society, from the government, from the people. So he's doing this, you know, he's raising money, he's making donations. He said he's paying back. And, and that's good for him. It's, it's a choice, though. It's freedom. It's his choice. If he wants to give money to anybody, you see a homeless person, don't go to your neighborhood jailhouse and pull the police with you and take another person's money to satisfy 
your desire to help them. Give them 20 bucks. Set them up in the house. If everybody has the freedom to do that on their own without resorting to force. And that's what taxation schemes are. It's force. So it's either freedom or not. Do you want to live free or not? To be free is unjust. <laughs> it's, yeah, to be free is to be unjust. Okay. Yeah. You know, with the whole, uh, should the rich help, be able to do to help people? I mean, if you look at the example with the, the, the Western medical school, you know, if that person has, wants to get a private donation of this, that's their right, they have the right. But if you were to say, what's more better spent, helping Grandpa's public school or helping Western, I would say helping Grandpa's public schools. I, I work in Grandpa's public schools as a volunteer almost every day of the week. There are kids, sophomore level high schoolers, who cannot read at a fourth grade level. Now tell me how letting them just go through any help will allow them, they will get to Western, maybe someday get to this medical school. The medical school is just gonna help the people that are already gonna help it, or are gonna get to get there. It's just whether or not they go to there or maybe Michigan, you know? I, I think that better be better spent on um, an area that is broken and make that better so more students have the opportunity, a better opportunity, I mean, they still have an opportunity, but it's more increased to reach higher potential. Um, I have, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink it. I mean, if you're gonna grow up in Grand Rapids Public Schools and you're gonna have the education of Grand Rapids Public Schools, I think that if you're gonna sit in class and you know the, uh, the environment and everything else that is a factor in Grand Rapids Public Schools, I've seen kids that thrive in Grand Rapids Public Schools because they take the eight, they go over and beyond, they take the resources that are provided and they go over and beyond. Some kids just would rather go, oh, well, I'd rather go do this, this, and this instead of reading a book because of the environment they're in. Some people have that the access to books and to read and to get proper teaching and tutoring they just don't go over and beyond in doing so. If the sources are there, not as extreme as maybe, you know, a different school, a private school, but they're still there. I just don't see that you can just always point at that. I think some of the parents, they should be, take the welfare programs and teach them how to teach their kids how to read and to teach them just to get it more fixed and involved because the resources are there. There's AP classes in Grand Rapids Public Schools. There's a lot of classes and resources you can use, but a lot of them just don't use them. I, I agree. I think people, um, you have to either believe people are inherently good, hardworking, or you have to believe that people are inherently lazy and bad. And in my opinion, people are inherently lazy because if I had a bunch of money, I would not go to work. But I don't have a bunch of money. I'm hungry. Tomorrow, if I don't work, I'm going to be hungry. So therefore, I go to work every day. I work to better myself so I can live. So um, you can give Grand Rapids more money. You can give Detroit more money. They're not gonna. They're not gonna produce results. By giving them more money, they're gonna raise teacher salaries. You know that. They're gonna. Well, let's have an ACT program, an ACT ACT prep program. That's not gonna help. It's not gonna help. You gotta. You gotta want it. You gotta want it. So all failures. Well, what about giving them incentives? We give all these big companies tax breaks and incentives whenever they make new technology. Or, you know, if we give teachers some type of incentive, you don't think there would be results? Because these big companies are making some big results and they're getting some big tax breaks and it's affecting the whole community, you know, social. If they're giving out, if they're not even giving any money in taxes, but they're making a lot of money, what type of free ridership is that? They're making multi-million dollar companies, GE, one of them being, because they 
are so innovative in technology that they come up with so many inventions that they didn't have to pay any taxes last year. None. They made $42 billion and they paid no taxes. What's wrong with that? that there's something wrong with that. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, oh. Something's wrong with that. Okay, I guess I'm kind of a mixture of everything. Like, the high school I went to, we were poor. Very, very poor. But I'm still here. We're probably worse off than Grand Rapids public schools. We don't have all the elective classes that they can take. I didn't have French. I had Spanish. That was it. We had 20-year-old textbooks. But I'm still here. I still learn. I still strive. What does money have to do with wanting to better yourself? I should you have had well, yeah, it should have been there, but it wasn't. But I still, I'm still here. I, th I think a big thing that, over here. <laughs> I think a big thing that we need to remember, though, is I don't know where this whole idea that everyone needs to go to get a higher education. I don't know where that idea came from, and quite frankly, I think that's what's just destroying our economy. I, and I think honestly, because we have the media and we have politicians and we have employers saying, "Oh, you have to have this college degree." And what's happening is that obtaining that college degree is so easy now. And we're seeing a bastardization of what a degree actually is. The bachelor's today of yesterday is the math. Let me get that. The master's today is nothing but a bachelor's before. And I, I think that's what, what we're going to see happen is we wonder why the auto industry crashed. We wonder why we have all these other problems. It's because people became overqualified and they wouldn't compete for a lower job. And I think that we'd see more jobs if people were actually allowed to succeed without a college education. Should people go to college? Yes, they should. But they, don't, they shouldn't have to. And another thing that we see is the wealthy, wealthy who had to struggle to get wealthy tend to give more than those who got it for free. Well, I mean, we see that all the time. The reason people go to school or uh, uh, college is because they think uh, education can equalize uh, them. Uh, you know, equalizer, that's what we say with the same degree, and you, you know, you can get a job, so those inequalities can be easily wiped out. Um, this just goes back to the public school thing. Um, I live in Grand, Rapids, or in Grand Rapids Public School District, and my children go to Grand Rapids Public. And I don't think that they should have any less opportunities because I can't afford to pay the taxes in Rockford. I went to Rockford and to um, Grand Rapids Public and when I was in high school, and just the opportunities you have, it's ridiculous. There, there is such a huge, um, yeah, it's just huge between, I had the same book in seventh grade that I had in, I think, 11th grade between the two because we couldn't afford books. And that's just not fair. And I think as far as kids go, because I can't provide for my kids to live in a better district doesn't mean they should suffer. So I'm ask you government for but more money. Look at, there's schools in Detroit. I don't understand why we're talking about Detroit being so bad. Yeah, there's some schools in Detroit that are bad, but there's an income per student and it's variant per district. Rockford made the bare minimum. I don't understand why people keep thinking Rockford's so rich because I, was I, was, I went to Rockford and it's not. We, Rockford got the bare minimum income per student. It was $7,500. There's schools in Detroit that got $14,000 per student. There's schools, I think, I think the, even the Grand Rapids. The difference there is the tax bases are different. So the property values in Rockford are higher than they are in Detroit or in Grand Rapids. So that's why the state makes a discrepancy between the amount of money they give to those districts. They have to make up for the loss of property tax revenue to equalize it across the board. So Rockford is wealthier than Detroit and Grand Rapids. Yeah, they're probably just in that, in the, up to their eyeballs anyways. I think they're not really wealthier. Anyways, what I was going to say a long time ago was back to Western, back to Western, was someone donated a whole bunch of money as well to Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo Public Schools, to let students who decided to go to Western Michigan go free full ride. Is that not a benefit to those students at Western? That is fantastic. So you can't say that that's unfair. And I forgot everything else I was going to say because I had to wait so long. So here you go. Um, I, um, I don't think people realize how poor the Grand Rapids Public Schools really are. Um, it's actually in the elementary. It's a dollar per student that the teachers get. 
I don't know where the hell you're pulling your numbers from, but it's a dollar per student. I don't know what you can do with a dollar, but you can't supply your kids with anything. Um, these kids don't have any kind of opportunity. Now they have pay to play sports. Their parents can afford for them to pay rent half the time. You think they can afford to pay $300 so they can play football? Rock they have no incentives to go to school. What, they can't afford to play football so they have absolutely no incentive to do well in, high, you know, in education because they don't have any fun. A lot of these kids have jobs. They're supporting their parents. You know, I mean, there's just a lot of factors that you don't, you don't look into, but they're really deprived. Um, I had a choice to go to which school I went to. I, I live in Union District. I chose to move out of the school, or er, to take the bus to get out of the school district, to get out of um, public schools. There's a choice, there's a school of choice. You have to sign up. I had to sign up at least three months in advance before school started. I had to take a bus, I had to wake up at six, um, at five every day to catch the bus to go to Comstock Park because I didn't want to be in a public school. There's a choice to go to these poor schools if you want. I mean, yeah, it's sad that they're poor, but I mean, you have the choice to go to a different school if you want to. I did it, anybody else can do it. I had to pay for my bus fare every day. A dollar fifty to get on the bus, a dollar fifty to get off the bus. Had to do it. Um, I was just gonna say, yeah, there is a choice, but um, I went to Grand Rapids Public Schools. I graduated from uh, Creston High School, and then I also just graduated from Grand Valley in just last <coughs> December. Um, there is a choice to decide what school you want to go to. You can move out of a public school and go to Rockford. You can go to Northview. You can go to a different school. But what it boils down to is money still needs to be invested in the public schools. Otherwise, they're not going to get any better. Those kids aren't going to have any foundation for a decent education. So something has to be invested into them. And the whole thing with the whole don donating to Western, people donate to Grand Valley all the time, the Seedman School of Business. It's just the wealthy supporting the wealthy. I mean, it doesn't get much more simpler than that. It's just a status symbol. They need to be investing the money in the schools. Otherwise, you're never going to have a good foundation for those kids to do anything with themselves. I had Spanish as an elective, but the science department at Grand Rapids Public Schools is horrible. I originally wanted to go to med school, and I couldn't because I didn't have a good science background. And if you don't have the basics to teach those kids, how are they going to be successful in the real world? You shouldn't have had to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. You should have been sleeping in, eating a good breakfast, studying. You shouldn't have had to do that. That's the point. Comstock Park is a public school. Why did you have to go all the way out there to get an education? I went to uh, Kent City, and they were just voted in one of the, uh, I think it was number nine, worst schools in Michigan. And that is an upper middle class country school. They're not Grand Rapids. So you're saying, so we're upper middle class. We get money from the government. It's still a terrible school. I mean, I would hear teachers complain about money problems all the time. That's not the problem. The problem was the people that ran the numbers and they were screwing us over. But I'm not saying that helped me back at all because some of the smartest, some of the, our valedictorian, I mean, they're, they're going to schools that are uh, MSU, U of M. Central, Western, it's not that our schools are broke, that's why people can't learn, it's who chooses to learn. Um, uh, I graduated from one of the richest counties throughout the United States. Really? Which we one? had <laughs> Spanish, that was it, no other foreign languages, so just like the rest of you, I think, you know, even though coming from a richer county, we still had the same opportunities. Now they're giving you Chinese, French, or Spanish, so as time's gone on, they've been able to expand, but opportunity's been the same. Oh, yeah. Um, my stepsister, she actually went to a poor school. She went to Lee High School. It's a really, really small school. She, um, their programs are horrible. I, I went there myself. I didn't, I hated it there, but, um, I had I ended up moving in with my mother, but she she stayed there. She is um, she was a valedictorian at the school. She goes to state right now. She didn't let any of that hold her back. She picked up a job. She did all this, even though the school system was crap. She did all advanced placement classes, everything she could do, and she's at um, state right now. So it's not really the money problem. I mean, if you want to do it, you can get it done. Well, I love pushing you guys, Dr. Bai. I don't mean to, mm. to dominate, but I love I love pushing go these ahead. students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. There's always success, right? We can go back to the 1880s in the United States, and I teach U.S. history, and there were Horatio Alger stories. There were people that came from absolute nothing. Andrew Carnegie become become one of the richest men in the history of the United States. 
that doesn't excuse the fact that in this country we pretend all the time to be a country of equality of opportunity. I agree with you guys. Capitalism is a good motivator. It creates, dif it differentiates us from each other. That doesn't mean that we are equal. We are not equal. We do not have equality of opportunity. We like to pretend that we do, but we don't. If you're all willing to admit that, it, but it doesn't seem to me that you are, you keep saying there is equality of opportunity when you're admitting you get on a bus to escape your school district to go to another one. That's not equality of opportunity. My, my question is, uh, why is uh, inequality so undesirable? Why is that bad? Why is uh, inequality so bad? I'd like to pose a question. I, I think it's very good to have the type of dialogue we have because these are Indeed. very, very tough topics. Very tough topics. But I think we need to think about, we need to think about our thinking. Okay, if for some reason you found whether you have a system blame or individual blame perspective, if for some reason you found that your source of information is incorrect, it's totally false, would you be willing to change your thinking? Well, good point. Go ahead. I, mine was, had to do with the school before we all, this uh, withhold equal opportunity. You know, you, you have people that come out of there that, you know, that have the worst circumstances, they still get out. But, you know, I've had friends who, if they don't get home out of school right away, they've been beat by their parents because, and they, and they have to be take care of their, their, their little sister, little brother, because the parent has to work all the time or doesn't want to take care of the kids because they're tired from working. You know, how does that make it equal for that student? You know, getting up early to go to a different district, it shouldn't have to deal with that. It should be, the school should be equal for every single person. If it's a public school, it should be equal all around. That's an interesting point. People overcome human adversity all the time. People survive the concentration camps. So yeah, people are gonna get out of Grand Rapids Public Schools, but should there be such a big difference between Grand Rapids Public and East Grand Rapids? I, would, I, I, can't, I can't stress this enough. I gotta keep going back to the same thing, free or not. If you believe that you have a right to dictate to me with a gun in your hand and a badge on, where and when and how to spend what I earn as a result of my intellectual ability, regardless of what level of intellect I'm at, because I'm, I'm no Einstein, then that's not freedom. Essentially, what, what we're debating here is freedom or not. And the rest of the world, look at it. Look at what has happened. I mean, look at what happened to Soviet Russia. People in hovels looking up at the Soyuz. Good for them, they were all equal. No, that, that, that's that's a bit of a mis, that's a bit of a misleading statement. I mean, the idea that Soviet Russia ever had the kind of prosperity that the United States has is they never did. They never they did. Never even that's right. They never went through an industrial revolution. They weren't really a Marxist state. It was all a, it was all a sham. This what we're talking about here is should there be equality of opportunity? You guys already pay taxes. If we want to have a discussion about not paying taxes at all, that's a different kind of discussion. I think. But we all believe in this moral obligation not to harm other people deliberately. Is withholding taxes doing that? I'll go back to Dr. Bai's original question. If you get the choice to decide where your taxes are spent and you choose not to spend them on your fellow man, are you creating a moral problem? No. You know, and, I, and I guess I want to I disagree with you. Because this discussion is not about free, being free or not. It's about freedom. And there's a vast difference. When we talk about the history of this country, it was, it, it's been founded on this journey of equality from the time, we, from the, time the Constitution was written. Actually, and, well, actually it was. And if we go back, women couldn't vote. People of color, only white <coughs> male landowners could vote. And they were and slaves, that, that's and, not equality. And that meant, once again, wait, I didn't interrupt you. I'm sorry. Thank you, all right. And when we talk about that, we asked how many people owned property in here, five hands went up. And those of you who are women, you don't count. Only the white males owned property could vote. And for the last 200, 300 years, we've been on this journey of trying to understand and create equality. And we're not there yet. And the challenge is these discussions help us. You know, we see a lot of, a lot of different perspectives coming out, a lot of different ideas and concepts. And that, that sort of validates the fact that we're still on this journey. And the fact that 
the difference is in here. Strongly suggest we haven't figured it out yet. But it's, it's not about freedom. It's about how do we create opportunities in this world. One of the things that um, the NBA draft, who gets the first round draft pick? An NBA draft, who gets the first round draft pick? Uh, who? It's going to be the Pistons. OK, well, you could get lucky. But once again, you know, in its purest sense, who gets the first round draft pick? OK. So we have a lottery, but normally they're going to give the worst team the best opportunity. Is that, is that, is that? Yeah, OK. So why do you give the worst team the opportunity to choose the best players? What happens to that worst team? It's compensation. OK. And once again, we begin to find out, once you improve the, the worst team, the entire league improves. As the entire league improves, every team begins to benefit. And so one of the principles we talk about in equality is as we, you know, as we lift the water tide rises, the boat rises, and we all do better. And we, we get caught up on whether we compete or whether we cooperate. And I think that's the real question, is how do we create a society or continue this journey of understanding cooperation? And how do we understand by, by helping those who have least? We actually give more. Adam Smith in economics talks about principle of self-enlightened interest. And that whole principle is, Adam Smith talks about exactly what Bill Gates is doing. Let me give my money away. Because as I give my money away to help those across the country, Bill Gates knows he would be better. Henry Ford started the Ford, Ford dealership, I mean the Ford Motor Company. He said, people can't buy my products. So he began paying people $5 a day. One reason, so they could begin to buy his cars. So as we help others, we also help ourselves. Henry Ford today, Ford's the only company in the US who didn't need to buy it. The man had a brilliant idea. So anyway, that's just my comment. That's very good. Excellent very history. Good. Yeah, yes, that's very good. So one more. Maybe. One more? Yeah. Uh, Down here? Yeah. This was to the comment about the education. And he was saying that, you know, it used to be that you could graduate out of high school and have a job at GM. That's what people aspired to. They didn't aspire to go to college because those factory jobs were there. But we, we, we don't live in an industrialized civilization like that anymore. Most of the jobs in Michigan that were auto, automobile linked are gone. They're shipped overseas. So people do, in fact, do have to go to college to better themselves, to make the money. This is a, a world now where you do have to have a degree to bring yourself up. It doesn't pay not to go to college anymore. You really do have to go. Diversity is a rare commodity. It is so important. We learn from each other, and then we're becoming more tolerant to each other. That's why we have this conversation. Actually, guys, I learned so much from you today, from your conversation, from the dialogue. Thank you, you know. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, thank you to Dr. Bai and uh, to all of you for enlightening conversation. I hope you will uh, visit some of the other talks at the Race and Ethnicity Conference. Thank you.